What it do, flight crew? FTC. Flight team stand up. We got some so fresh, so clean, clean, mini educational-ish. Kind of, sort of. You know what I'm saying? You guys passed your quiz last time. A 72% passing rate. Clap it up, clap it up. Now, there won't be no test or quiz this week, but some nice, informative type of information. I found this channel on my recommended. Shout out to Extra Mint. You know what I'm saying? Go ahead and run the subs up. Why did the 2010s look like that? Let's check Black it out. Guns, MLG, troll face, and swag. The internet was a very different place in the 2010s. Memes used to look like this, and YouTube was filled with I content remember. you couldn't make today. Regardless mm -hmm. of whether you fell in love with Vaporwave, or spent way too long watching shooting star memes, you might be wondering where all of this went, and what it Time even changes. was. So, as things get stranger and stranger, we'll dig into the 2010s to try and find out why. It is crazy, bro. We're literally out the 2010s. Because every 10 years is a decade. And this guy also has, um, you know, different videos like, why did the 2000s look like that? Look, the 90s look like that. Let me know if y'all want to check those out, too. Internet awesome sauce. It's 2024 and everything has a name, including this visual style from the early 10s. Known as Internet Awesome Source, it was most prevalent from 2008 to 2016. There's a suspicious correlation between the popularity of the word epic and the use of images like these. Common elements were rainbows, cats, dinosaurs, unicorns, and lasers. People were obsessed with lasers. Outside of memes and gifs, really? this aesthetic could be seen all over the internet. The intro of Uncle Grandpa is a good example, showing him riding a tiger propelled by rainbows. It was also I used to lie, I probably never Robot seen Unicorn that. Attack from 2010, exemplifying the style. I Other think I remember that game. I didn't play it though. Tuba simulator in mini games like Puggle and Techno Kitten Adventure. If you were browsing YouTube in 2011, you might have even seen Let Internet Medley, which boasted over 40 memes in one song. With the flying yarn cats and rainbow puke, there isn't much more you could ask for. But anyway, why was this kind of humor and style so popular? While a lot of these were ironic, rainbows and unicorns formed the comedic basis of too many memes to count. Nyan Cat was close to the top of the most viewed videos in 2011, making it a cultural phenomenon. This, and the popularity of things like shooting stars, influenced the fascination with combining explosions and lasers to make the most epic image possible. To truly appreciate this, you've got to understand that at the time, random equaled funny. Coupling a mythical, peaceful creature like a unicorn with destruction and chaos didn't only look cool, it was unexpected and therefore humorous. This and the popularity of My Little Pony are big reasons videos like pink fluffy unicorns dancing on rainbows have tens of millions of views. If we look at some other trends from around 2011, this begins to make a bit more sense. With social media on the rise, it was easy bro, to- Bro, I remember when a YouTube page used to look like that, bro, when I first was like starting out, like, and then it, like the same year I started, that's when everything like started to change with the site and stuff. And share clips to a wider range Yo, of the idea damn, of Damn, this is nostalgic, bro. Bro, the YouTube site literally looked like this back then, even the video. Traction meaning that humor often leaned into the absurd and confusing. Naturally, Awesome Source perfectly slots into this landscape with its use of random combinations and niche internet memes. MLG. Oh, now I'm thinking if about it. If you never had XX underscore as part of your username, you were doing something wrong. The brain rot no. of today pales in comparison to the content juggernaut that was MLG. You might have watched now, what I was going to say is I thought he was going to be talking about like the first person shooter games, but like definitely 2010s, that's when that whole thing Chief was in the, the like Game of Thrones or any number of trick shot edits. If it was really bad, I do remember this even, though. The M, like anything tied like MLG, I do remember that a couple of times. Like, called downloading green there. screen packs and piecing together your own. Some of the more iconic visuals were Snoop Dogg, random quick scopes, Cool Ranch Doritos and COD hit markers. Horror Cynical was a major perpetrator, being the man behind MLG Teletubbies and furry inflation art. I find it crazy to look back and see the views on some of these videos. Many are well above 10 million, which speaks Sheesh. to the absolute chokehold they had on the internet. Another recurring detail was Illuminati Confirmed, which would often involve a text-to-speech voice linking random things to the all-seeing eye. With that and enough explosions and air horns, you could turn any no-scope into a work of art. Outside of the visuals, they featured numerous sound effects and songs that are probably imprinted deep within your temporal lobe. If you weren't humming it already, My Hope Will Never Die or Holding On was the most iconic, 
with the X-Files theme also playing a major role. The horrific audio of successful trickshot reactions was featured a lot too. If you're a real one, comment with the rest of this phrase. Oh, baby. These kinds of edits can be traced back to as early as 2011. Specifically, a World of Warcraft video made by Jamal. With the green screen overlay of a quickscope, it provides the first known example of an MLG style montage. The reason such videos rose to prominence is in the name. Major League Bro, Gaming. just any, honestly, most of these types of videos definitely used to eat back then. Especially like the old, old phase clips back then, bro. The trick shots and all of that. Bro, I remember I would be like on my little eye touch back in the day in high school, bro. Just like looking at those comps like all the time. There'd be like three minute or like four minute comps of just doing some hardcore trick shots. Bro, and bro, the professional esports team numbers. released highlight reels that went on to inspire fans to begin making their own. With many of these simply being replays recorded by an iPhone, they were usually much worse in quality and far more amusing. As the internet did its thing, these became more and more deranged, and eventually morphed into the irony laden masterpieces that plagued the 2010s. Unlike the memes of today, MLG lasted a few years before losing traction, disappearing, for the most part, in 2017. Wow. Yeah. Even though the last decade was only a few years ago, things have changed a lot online. Here mm -hmm. on YouTube, this is especially apparent. A perfect case study for this is the rise and fall of Let's Plays. Let's Plays are the reason many of your favorite YouTubers are your favorite YouTubers. Broadly, this style of video involved commentary over clips of a video game that focused on the player's experience of it rather than a guide or a walkthrough. The general format is credited to Michael Sawyer, or Slow Beef, whose 2007 playthrough of The Immortal is widely considered to be the first modern Let's Play. As YouTube began to take off, this style of video did as well. People like PewDiePie would emerge with wildly successful series like his horror playthroughs. The draw here wasn't just the game, it was his reactions and experience of it. By naming enemies and objects like Stefano, he built up his own lore inside these videos that kept people coming back regardless of the game he was playing. Markiplier found similar Whoa, success with his five damn months, boy! Man had that dub pack before me, man. The first of which was that uploaded man's in August of Blood 2014 that and shit? currently sits at over 100 million views. Today, however, Let's Plays are seemingly a thing of the past, at least as a method of blowing up. Arguably, this is mostly due to the oversaturation of gaming content on the site. Making a video titled Let's Play XYZ Episode 3 isn't as likely to take off anymore in a sea of very similar videos. The current landscape does, however, favor challenge videos with an interesting premise, like the Fallout series by It's Jabo. Another reason Let's Plays have disappeared is that they haven't. They've just moved. Instead of watching a YouTube video, much of the audience for Let's Plays has shifted over to streaming. Yeah, I was just about to say that. Kai! Here they can tune in whenever they want and watch a content creator what was they this like again? The game for much longer periods of time. Moving on, if you ever watched the Cake Trilogy by Filthy Frank, Idubs, and Max Mofo, you likely remember when shock humor reigned supreme. By around 2016, this had come to a peak, with gaming content becoming slightly less popular. In an interview with Trash Taste, PewDiePie refers to this as the Filthy Frank era. A time when even he adapted to the change by making edgier content with a raspier voice. Okay. <laughs> Can I take your boyfriend for a ride? <laughs> what? He's in. This was partially the byproduct of ambiguity surrounding YouTube's content policies. There wasn't as clear of a line between unacceptable and acceptable practices. People were maintaining high viewerships and growing exponentially while saying what and doing hell? things that would be pulled from the site today. For example, the Cake Trilogy was retroactively removed following a more recent reaction from PewDiePie. This likely reminded YouTube that they still existed and didn't align with the updated content guidelines. In 2017, we saw the beginning of this with the Adpocalypse. I remember at the time this felt remember like that. a huge deal, with many large channels being legitimately concerned about their income. The term describes a mass withdrawal of advertisers from YouTube following several large-scale controversies. Many were no longer comfortable showing ads on content that wasn't family-friendly, resulting in some channels receiving ads while others didn't. For creators like Filthy Frank, this made it all but impossible to make money from their videos. This meant that there was less incentive to make edgy, humorous content and it quickly declined in popularity. Some of these YouTubers adapted and continue to thrive on YouTube today. Others, like Frank, haven't been seen since 2017. I have, however, wow. found an artist called Joji who sounds strangely similar to Pink Guy. What? It's hard to categorize something as unpredictable as memes, let alone analyze their use through an entire decade, but we're gonna do it anyway. Thanks to Reddit users like Paper Cup, there's been many attempts to organize them into specific eras. Today, we'll be focusing on three that span the 2010s. 
Rage, Dank, and Surreal. Starting with Bro, Rage, Dank this memes. term is derived from Rage Comics, which began in 2008 on sites like 4chan. These would typically be short, with four panels based around humorous or irritating real-life experiences. The common thread was a collection of so-called rage faces made in MS. Whoa! Recognized troll face, rage guy, why you know guy, and serial guy. This became more widespread with the inception of R forward slash in 2009. Funnily enough, this is still active, although not nearly as prolific. Top and bottom text memes were pretty big at this time as well. Slapped on top of images like Bad Luck Brian, Overly Attached Girlfriend, and Boromir. These all followed simple formulas that anyone could relate to and make themselves. All it required was an internet connection, the impact font, and a dream. As 2013 rolled around, we can identify a shift into the dank meme era. Here, memes became considerably more abstract, and less centred around understandable and repetitive tropes like these. This period encapsulates the peak of MLG, the use of these glasses, and Shrek is love, Shrek is life. Still, these were far from the most iconic. 9 plus 10, Harambe, Vape Nation, We Are Number One, and Even the Way all emerged in a similar time frame. Instagram meme accounts started to become huge, all as part of a multi-platform ecosystem that produced, propelled, and modified memes throughout their life cycle. A big reason some of these were so bizarre and nonsensical was that Gen Z was growing up and becoming increasingly active on social media. By using themes and references that only they could understand, they distanced themselves from older generations and formats. This is also why some of them were quite edgy, with all of it playing a role in forming their own distinct online identity. You can see this reflected in the creators who were popular among the demographic. As I mentioned before, if you weren't watching Let's Plays, you might have tuned into Max Mofo, iDubs, or Filthy Frank, who had collaborations that spawned some of the most shared memes and phrases. A perfect example of this is the green screen of It's Time to Stop, which appeared in hundreds of edits on multiple platforms. Next up is the Surreal Era, that kicked off in the late 2010s. This was home to deep fried memes, crab rave, and of course, the release of Fortnite. To be honest, things started Bro, to take a turn for the worse. Fortnite. Deep fried memes were made by running an image through a filter over and over until it became warped and barely legible. This would be combined with an equally ridiculous piece of text, if any at all. Surreal memes, on the other hand, often featured this guy. He was associated with things like the layers of irony and the term angry, popping up everywhere online. Mr. Orange or Orang is another example. Consistent with its name, this humour operated on a similar premise to much older memes. To be random and confusing was to be funny. Not many of these made sense, and it was often that and their absurdity that made them entertaining. Happy Wheels, Balloons Tower Defense, and The Impossible Quiz have one thing in common. They are all flash games. The mid-2000s and the early 2010s are considered the golden age for this kind of gaming. Most of my exposure to these titles was on Cool Maths games, where I spent oh, hours playing Fireball and Water Man, Watergirl. Cool Maths games saved the damn day during school, bro. Now, that really didn't honestly come into, like, maybe I'll say, like, 10th grade and after. Yeah, when Cool Maths games. Because there was another site, like, I don't know if you guys remember, like, before Cool Maths games that niggas was on, like, playing, like, cool-ass games, like, similar to how they was on there on the site. Now, that's crazy as hell, man. That definitely, bro... Days where it's like, especially like you had substitute teachers and stuff, and if you had like a computers and your and stuff in like your class, like the like them old school PCs and stuff, bro. Yeah, that that, that used to like feed families. Papa's bro. diarrhea. Yo, I distinctly remember spamming the sauce until I had a stack about three feet tall, selling it for zero dollars, and then quitting the game. Turning back time even further, Flash first released in 1996. People eventually figured out that it was possible to make games on it with many of them starting to pop up in the early 2000s. The website Newgrounds emerged at a similar time, and soon became <coughs> a massive platform for user-generated Flash games. This website made it possible for almost anyone to produce, share, and play others' work online, with the only requirement being a clickable link. Of course, these games weren't limited to Newgrounds, as they could be embedded and accessed through any other website, like Cool Maths games. This meant that if your game wasn't received well in one place, there was always a chance it could take off in another. As a result, it's no surprise that some of these games became massive. Happy Wheels was, and still is, huge. YouTubers like PewDiePie and Markiplier did Let's Plays that received millions of views, Sheesh. with Jacksepticeye uploading as recently as April 2024. By now, you've likely heard that Flash is no longer a thing, but you might be surprised to learn that the end of Flash games was heralded by Steve Jobs way back in 2010. In his famous Thoughts on Flash letter, he criticised Adobe for Flash's security issues, poor performance, and the fact that it was a closed system. 
This meant that Apple would have less control over the software and any bug fixes, being one of the main reasons they refused to support it on iOS. As the years passed and things like HTML5 rose to prominence and offered more security, Flash sped towards the inevitable. Soon enough, Adobe announced its end of life in 2017 and Flash took its last breath in 2020. Thankfully, many of these games were preserved and it's entirely possible to still play them. This isn't to say, however, that thousands weren't lost to time. Hmm. Vaporwave? If you recognise this image, you most likely remember Vaporwave. Uh, this picture is the cover of Floral don't. Shop, an album made by the artist Vectroid. The most iconic song from the selection was Lisa Frank 420. This was used everywhere, in memes, edits, and often as part of YouTube outros. Of course, Vaporwave was much more than just a subgenre of music. It was also a distinct and fascinating aesthetic that began on the internet. Common features included retro 3D graphics, pink and purple pastels, dolphins and foliage. After its inception in the early years of the decade, Vaporwave began to rapidly spread over numerous platforms. Whether you found it on commentary channels or songs on Bandcamp, bro, I it remember quickly Leafy, became bro. undeniably huge, peaking at around 2015. There was even an entire game called Mall Quest made in this style. Copies of this can still be found online, although the original version was taken down. It was described as a procedurally generated shopping sim, and it actually looked pretty cool. Returning to design, you might notice that, for an aesthetic born in the 2010s, it feels a bit out of place. That's because most of the imagery you're seeing here was heavily inspired by the 80s and 90s. This transcended architecture, with one of the most influential artifacts being a game. Echo the Dolphin, for the Sega Genesis, informed music and aesthetics alike, largely responsible for the heavy use of dolphins in design. I remember that, but I shop, never played it. One of the songs is even named after this title. If you were big on Vaporwave in the 2010s, there's a good chance you recall some of its numerous subgenres. I've mentioned this before, but one of my personal favourites is Mallsoft. Being quite liminal, this would pair shops and plazas with subtle edits to bring out their colour. Another recognisable style is Synthwave. While sharing similar elements to Vaporwave, it's actually an entirely separate aesthetic. Where it celebrates the neon colours and media from the 80s, Vaporwave presents a more satirical and at times political reflection of the 80s and 90s. Synthwave is responsible for all of the backgrounds you had that looked like this. Endless grids, cityscapes and cars. Oh. I don't remember how many times I put on one of these videos, but it was definitely more than once. Anyway, unlike other aesthetics in this video, Vaporwave and Synthwave are still active in smaller online communities. While they are far from their previous position in the mainstream, you can still find new releases if you know where to look. Swag? You either have it or you don't. But if you're bro, subscribed, Bro, 2010's you drip was so it. crazy, Swag. bro. Like, bro, it, it just... You gotta also, like, picture, because, like, people that are, like, 90s babies and shit, you know what I'm saying? Like... Bro, it went from like that baddie area, that baddie era and stuff like that, and then like that swag jerk era. You know what I'm saying? Snapback era, like all of a sudden in like the 2010s. Like I remember that like crazy ass shift. I do it. I don't think I own not one of these types of hats before, and I never like you know dressed in like the jerk phase or nothing like that. I definitely was hitting that, but you know I said half the team, half the team hit this type shit. But like all jokes aside, um, I definitely. You know what I'm saying? Had them snapbacks, bro. I was a snapback king, bro. Like, bro, I had about, like, a cool, like, 11, 13 snapbacks, bro. And, like, time, like, especially in, like, 11th grade, bro. I thought I was him, dog. No, seriously. Like, that was a whole, like, era. In this context, describe the style of fashion that was... Lil B, bro? Wonton suit. Woo! Eat that, yo. Eat that, yo. Years before, pieces like You're a Jerk by the New Boys jump-started this new manifestation, which continued for a couple years. Bro, in niggas was really rocking like Elmo hats and stuff, the Cookie Monster hats and just making them fly. Cookie Monster shirts, clothing. making them fly. To be swagged out involved flat brim caps with the brim intact, rack spent on clothes and more hats, and your front and back labeled with Obey. Bro, that was like the basic, like, yo, this just streams 2010, bro. That shit is crazy, These though. caps were often brought down to cover your eyes in photos, which would then be put through the first filter available on Instagram or Tumblr. YMC and B, yo! Posting, That's that Tyga um, thing, thing right? Then. Scroll down Bro, funny thing is, I think if you look at my thing, I still got the OG Instagram logo. ...anyone's account, without liking anything, <coughs> of course, and you'll find a world of yellow, grainy filters and vignettes. Shutter shades were also pretty big at the time, I remember those shades. with people like Kanye frequently wearing them. Anyway, swag was boosted along by artists like Lil B, who posted the song I Own Swag in 2012. The term, then, was rapidly becoming widespread, in tandem with the production of too many ridiculous caps to count. 
This entire trend produced some of the most bizarre and iconic fits of the 21st century. Zendaya had some absolutely diabolical drip, and Justin Bieber was straight up malicious. Halfway through the decade, swag started to slow down, and massive obey caps became less and less desirable. The word itself evolved to become more ironic, and was largely replaced by words like drip among younger generations. That's facts. It was replaced with drip now. No by one said swag like that. The use of what is now known as Frutiga Aero had largely vanished. For a time after its decline, a similar aesthetic became more popular in corporate design. This is referred to as Frutiga Metro. You might have seen it on your Xbox 360, CDs, or textbooks. At the time, this style marked the beginning of more flat and minimalist approaches to UI. After all, it gets its name from the Metro design language created by Microsoft. This emphasized simple geometric patterns and shapes, absent of the glossy 3D look of the past. Windows 8 is a prime example of this, with its colorful selection of tiles and icons. The aesthetic is also known as Flat Frutiga Aero, as it shares a lot of the same imagery, but without the depth and glossiness. When looking at these designs, you'll notice the prevalence of speakers, dancing silhouettes, and swirls of color. It was pretty much the stock choice for making a product appear more interesting than it actually was. By slapping it on a CD or a poster, you could quickly add some vibrancy and energy. Much like Vaporwave, even it can be divided into smaller, equally recognizable categories. For example, Funky Metro, centered around instruments, DJs, and dancing, is a lot different to Grunge. Metro, which relates to scene and darker colors. Outside of its classifications, you could spot Frutiger Metro in a bunch of advertisements. This one for Nickelodeon is an interesting example, showing Jack Black amidst bright splashes of color. Going oh, as far Jack back as Black. 2004, we can find some of its earlier appearances, like the ad shown here. You'll notice that, much like Frutiger Aero, nature still played a big role in these designs. When shown alongside technology, this was likely done to help it appear less intimidating and more accessible. By animating things like plants and dolphins, devices could feel less alien and more familiar. The use of this style today has been overwhelmingly shelved in favor of minimalism, meaning it kind of served as a transitional period between the maximalist aesthetics of the 2000s and the flat designs of today. Looking at other videos we've done on this channel, on the 90s and the 2000s, you can make out clear, yeah, long lasting, and distinct those. aesthetic styles. A lot of these were used by I love corporations to, see to make technology one, appear advanced and exciting, hinged on an almost fantastical anticipation for the future. By the 2010s, this future was well underway, and with it, the internet. If you weren't logged in at the start of the decade, you definitely were before the end, and I know this because you're watching this video. The number of people who are online more than doubled from 2010 to 2020, Hell meaning yeah. that people's experiences of the world were increasingly informed by things on the internet. And so, the reason the 2010s looked like that is you. User-driven <laughs> like YouTube videos, Bro, just vines, flash directly. games, and memes sculpted millions of people's lives even outside of the internet. Simultaneously, this media started to become people's lives. Making videos with a shitty webcam was suddenly profitable, and the creation of content was something anyone could do. So while some of it may be cringe now, all of it played a role in creating what many consider to be the golden age of the internet. Nah, seriously. It has to go into the history books, bro. Has to. Hey, man, let me know if y'all want me to see the 2000s one next. But, bro, like, it, it is crazy. Because, like, I honestly say, like, the 2010s, I feel like which he kind of maybe left out or maybe he worded it a different way and I didn't catch on. Like, it's definitely when it comes to, like, going in, like, to the history books, that's definitely the year where technology, like, made a rise and took everything, you know what I'm saying, like, up. You know, like, there's, pro you know, adults during I definitely remember, like, you know, just around that time when, like, I just started getting interested in just doing things like like YouTube and stuff. Like, you know, adults would just be like, whoa, wait, what are you doing? Like, they were just looking at it like it was just like, you know what I'm saying? Like, the, the, the weirdest thing. And just now looking at it today with 2024, 90% of just, like, everything is just, like, internet-based and stuff. And it's just crazy how, like, you know what I'm saying, time has, like, you know what I'm saying, literally have gone by, changed. Um, what is your thing if anybody remembers from the 2010s? What was your favorite part about the 2010s? I think I ain't gonna lie I'm actually surprised he didn't mention more about like more like the gaming world I mean he did show like the first person shooter games with like Call of Duty and stuff I think my favorite favorite part in 2010s is I feel like that was like maybe outside of like 2000s If you're talking about like that PS2 or just like the Xbox regular era and stuff like that bro like the 360 and like the PS3, like all that time shift periods with all of those games, like I feel like that's what is making the games today and stuff like that. And even still, some of those games that was played back then, they can't even like mimic and make them, you know what I'm saying, anywhere near it, you know? So 
I definitely feel like video games took a major turn and, and stuff like that. And like the 2010s, honestly, probably we can really say it had the best video games, right? Because you got, you know what I'm saying, the actual gameplay, and then you got the upgraded graphics and stuff. Um, and then also on top of that, they was able to get away with like more like, like I'll say uncensored things. If it makes sense like that now, like I feel like nowadays a lot of the stuff has to be watered down to fit like certain, you know what I'm saying, advertisers or just like corporate type of shit. So I ain't gonna lie. It was weird because I remember when stuff got out of the early 2000s back in the day. Bro, like the first two years, I did not fuck with like the 2010s. Like at all, especially like when they was talking about like 2012. Bro, I don't know if you guys remember that. They was trying to say like 2012 was supposed to be like the end of human civil. Like the world was about to end and all that stuff. Like, bro, once it got, I was just looking at it like, man, this stuff is getting corny, bro. I don't know what's going on. And I ain't gonna lie. Once that PS4 dropped and stuff and that GTA 5 and stuff, it things kind of low-key got a little bit better. But I can humbly say, bro, like, I want to say maybe from like 2010 like, even, like, the Silly Bands era and stuff like that, up until, like, the PS4 and the X, uh, Xbox, uh, the new gen Xbox and stuff like that, bro, up until then, bro, it was low-key a little bit cringy, bro, I ain't even gonna lie to you, but, hey, man, to each his own, let me know how y'all feel.